The city club tries to get involved in the community, not, not only Misericordia, but all kinds of other stuff. And the uh, folks from Special Olympics Chicago had asked me to give to the treasurer a special license plate. And the reason it says 74 is uh, board member Sarah Burke here, right there, Sarah, right? Where's Sarah? Oh, there you are. Oh, Sarah, there we go, sorry. And Claire? Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, there we go. Uh, is because you're the 74th treasurer. So you put this on on behalf of the Board of Special Olympics Chicago, they asked me to give this to you. So I'm gonna give it to you right now, and then we can start our program. And thank you so much for all your civic and charitable contribution. Thank you. And so Sarah, if you guys wanna have a nice picture here later, don't be shy. Okay, you can tell the, your fellow board members you got this done. <clears throat> our guest today, is the Illinois State Treasurer. He has served as treasurer for nearly four years. Our guest today is the state's chief investment officer. He was born and raised in the small Champaign County farming community of Gifford, Illinois. Our guest today graduated from Rantoul Township High School. And Ed, what are the odds of this? and he attended Yale University, graduated in 1995. He spent two years in Taiwan, where he taught English to young students and learned to speak Chinese. Our guest today served on the Champaign County Board and in the Illinois State Senate. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Frerichs. Mike. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Jay, thank you very much. I really want to thank you for the license plate. Um, as I'll say in my remarks, we have made a real focus in our office on improving the lives, the quality of lives of people with disabilities. I was very happy to be out at uh, Special Olympics and to sign up a lot of families for our ABLE program. I'm also happy to hear there was a reason for the 74, in the 74th state treasurer, but I saw that and I thought, boy, they didn't do their homework very well. I was born in 1973, and I thought they just, <laughs> They just missed it by one year. I'm glad to see you were accurate and I just uh, am a little too self-centered self apparently. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Ferrix. I'm the Illinois State Treasurer. It is good to see so many familiar faces out in the crowd, to see so many friends here today. Um, <clears throat> let's just get something out of the way. I know you came here for the big announcement. Sometimes people will tease it, they'll make you wait, build some suspense, but let's just start it off and let you let you know, I'm here to announce I am not running for mayor of Chicago. That's, that's a whole lot more newsworthy than saying I was, along with a, a much larger group. Um, I want you to know, I'm a resident of the city of Champaign. For those who have asked if I was interested in running, I'm probably not qualified to run for mayor of Chicago. Although given past precedent, I have a number of nights I've spent here in the city of Chicago, and the fact that I have left a suit here in the city of Chicago, I could probably make the case thanks to Mike Casper. But, but that, that is not why I'm here. I'm here to talk about the treasurer's office, what we do, my own personal philosophy, and how I think we've quietly transformed the treasurer's office to solving a lot of problems over the last three and a half years. Now, my successor for my Senate seat, when we're back in Champaign, he'll introduce me. He will say things, he'll fre frequently say, you know, I tell people I replaced Senator Frerichs, they'll say, well, I wasn't aware that the treasurer's office could do so many of those things. And they'll say, you're right, because before he was treasurer, they didn't do a lot of those things. We've just taken on a lot of other challenges. And I think that part of my inspiration um, is, as a Democrat, as someone who looked up to people like uh, the Kennedys, was a quote that Bobby Kennedy made very famous. Some people see the way the world is and they ask why. I dream of things that never were and ask why not. And that's sort of been my philosophy in my life. You know, <clears throat> throughout my life I've asked a lot of questions and pushed back when people told me no. I remember my high school guidance counselor, I told her I wanted to apply to Yale. Her response was, don't waste your time. Don't waste my time. I applied anyway. 
And then when I got accepted, my parents' response was, we can't afford it. But I found a way. When I went there and someone suggested maybe I could go out for the rowing team, people told me, you know, you can't compete with East Coast prep school kids. Um, don't try. I rode on the crew all four years. I was told the Chinese was a difficult language to learn for someone like me. Well, I learned it. I never mastered it to the point where people mistook me for being a native Chinese speaker, <laughs> no matter how much I worked on my accent, but was able to speak it. And when I was 24 years old, I had this crazy idea to run for state representative, and people told me, there's no way you can beat a 22-year incumbent. And they were right. I lost. <laughs> But the point is, I see opportunities that other people don't always see, and I don't take no for an answer. And this pattern has led me to the treasurer's office, because a lot of people told me a downstate state senator is going to have a really difficult time winning a primary in a general election. So I ran, and we won. And when I won, we set about looking at the office and asking, why not? See why things were, but imagining the way things could be and asking, why not? Now let's start to give you an idea. I know I really love this office and my staff knows exactly what we do, but I have to remind myself there are some people who don't know exactly what it is the treasurer's office does. And I know that because they frequently ask me, what do you do in the treasurer's office? And I tell them, well, we are the chief investment officer for the state of Illinois. We invest the state's money. And they'll say, yeah, but you work for a state that has no money. What, what do you do all day long? Now, let me tell you, we do have money to invest, and they're in three distinct pots. The first is our state funds. We have over 700 different funds with fund balances. We have a total there of about $13 billion we invest. We help local units of government invest their money in a pooled fund. We invest about another $6 billion there. And we help families that are saving to put their kids to college. That's about another $11 billion there. So a total of about $30 billion that we oversee. Now, the safest route would be to do what we had always done. People don't really complain. It's not very dangerous doing what your predecessors did. But I asked, couldn't we be doing more? Couldn't we be making more money for the state? Because we know that every dollar we can bring in in interest is a dollar that the General Assembly and the governor don't have to raise in taxes, or a dollar in cuts they don't have to make to important services like education. So people told me, well, you really can't make a lot more because you're limited. State statute really limits what kind of investments we can make. They have to be conservative. They have to protect principle. But I can tell you, as a former state senator, when I'm told the reason that I can't do something is because state statute prohibits it, I have a ready-made answer. We'll just change state statute. <laughs> and so we reached out to my friends in the state senate and said, hey, would you help me? Give us a few more options, some other investment vehicles where we can, where we can park our money, where we can earn a greater return. We lengthen the amount of time we invested for. And you know, really what I did is I reached out to my staff and said, why not? I, I told them, let's make more money for the state. And they ran with it. And their numbers are impressive. I'm joined by several members of my investment team here today. Monthly return on investment when I came into office was $4 million, $4 million a month. As of uh, July this summer, we're at $23 million. Yeah. Thank you. We'll clap, we'll clap for those people at that uh, sort of center table there. You know, that's more than, they more than quadrupled the amount of interest we're bringing into the state. Now, a rising interest rate helped, but interest rates haven't quadrupled. What we found is that by finding, thinking outside the box, asking why not and finding other investment vehicles and changing the lengths of our maturities, we're able to bring in more money to the state. And that has not solved our budget problems, but we're interested in being part of the solution. And it helps. So we've also increased returns on behalf of Illinois funds. Took the same approach there. We have increased our returns, ready for this? By nearly 20,000%. Rodrigo Garcia is my chief investment officer. Can you? I, I need him to, even I read that number and I ask, is that in fact correct? Yeah, we were earning about one basis point 
and Illinois funds when we came in. And we're well over 200 at this point. It has been a phenomenal return. We did that while maintaining a triple A rating from Moody's. So, you know, we have good stories to tell. We also have good stories to tell in college savings. This is something very important to me because that story I led off with is completely true. Uh, when I told my parents, mom, dad, I got into Yale, my dad's response was, good for you. You're not going. And I said, why? And he said, well, we, we can't afford it. I said, dad, you haven't even looked at the financial aid package they gave me. He said, I don't need to look at that. I know we can't afford it. Now, I don't want any young person out there to be in that situation again. Someone who has worked hard, who's achieved, thought they re reached their goal and be told no because you don't have enough money. We wanted to make sure our college savings plans of the state were the best in the country. And that's what I tasked them with doing. So we looked at our structure, we reached out to our investment manager, our partners, and said, we're gonna need you to cut fees. And how do you suppose they responded to that? I do want to have some bankers here in the room. How? <laughs> um, they were not excited. But rather than calling them names or throwing a fit, we sat down, we listened to them. We retooled our programs in other ways as well. And as a result, we ended up cutting fees in half. And when we cut fees in half, we actually received a rating upgrade from Morningstar. Let me say that again. An Illinois program received a rating upgrade from Morningstar. That's not a headline you read too often here in Illinois. But we're excited about that. You know, this, uh, they gave us a gold rating, the highest rating they give to our Bright Start program. Our Bright Directions, they gave it a silver rating. That's the highest they give for an advisor sold program. So that, in addition to the reduced fees, have led to impressive growth out there. We've had double digit increase in do dollars, assets in our management, and in new accounts being created in the state of Illinois. And that is gonna help put a lot more young people on a pathway to success. This happened because we didn't take no for an answer. It happened because we have a very talented team here who went out and made that happen. Now, I think the government operates best. <clears throat> I love this opportunity to talk because we get to share some of this. But not everyone can be here at the City Club and we have a story to tell. And so we wanted to make sure that we were more transparent and more open. And so we created a new website and we call it The Vault. And you can go to our website and find all kinds of information about our investments. You can make comparisons. You can see how we're doing. You can s put in various ranges and create pie graphs and charts. Um, and what the vault will do, provide a wealth of information on investment programs, investment services, and business activities. So we encourage individuals and companies to use this. Visitors to the vault will find impressive numbers, the kind of things we've returned. And they'll also find what I think are impressive numbers in terms of MWVD utilization. So MWVD, for those of you who don't work in the treasurer's office, stands for minority, women, veterans, or disabled owned firms. These are firms that traditionally have not been part of state government. When I came into office, I just spent a year campaigning around the state and I saw the great diversity of our state. What I found was the firms we were working with didn't represent that diversity. So what did we do? We opened up our doors. We encourage new firms to participate with the state. And so since 2015, we've increased the use of diverse managers from 1% when I came in to 76%. <laughs> I will take that applause as long as you realize that it was earned by a lot of people around my table. Because I asked, when told, well, they just they don't, such firms don't exist. We can't, we can't find firms that have the experience or the, uh, the ability to handle this, these kind of deals. Um, I asked why not and set them out and they found answers. In 2014, total assets brokered with MWVD firms was $603 million. In 2018, the total, fiscal year 2018, the total assets were $34 billion. That's a 60 time increase. We did something similar with our asset managers. In January of 2015, when I took office, we had $16 million with MWVD asset managers. By March of this year, that figure was $303 million, a nearly 20-fold increase. Yeah, thank you. We made a commitment to increase the diversity of our team and the firms we do business with, and I think these numbers show we have realized that commitment. Now, we're also in charge of unclaimed property in the treasurer's office. 
The Illinois State Treasurer is tasked with safeguarding of property, which could include cash, unpaid life insurance benefits, forgotten bank accounts, unused rebate cards, or things of the like. We hold more than $2 billion in unclaimed property for people and businesses and nonprofits in this state. We are legally required to hold on to that until we can track down the owners or their heirs. But I wanted to do better. We went to the General Assembly and asked them to help us do better, to return more money, to track down money that belongs to people. And some of you might have heard of some of those changes. We engaged in a fight with the life insurance industry. I came into office and discovered that there were some life insurance firms that would sell people policies, would take their premium payments, and when someone passed away, their loved ones wouldn't always be paid. You know, there were grieving widows and orphans who were not getting money that belonged to them. And I don't know what you th call that, but I call that simply wrong. So we went about fixing that and discovered over half a billion dollars in unpaid life insurance benefits. And so we passed legislation to make sure this wouldn't happen again. So we have brought in a lot more money to state government. But we also want to make sure we return this to people. We want to make sure we're better at returning this. And for the last three years, we have set records for unclaimed property returned. Two years ago, we returned $155 million to people and businesses and nonprofits in the state. Last year, we broke that record. We returned $159 million. And then this year, as of the end of this fiscal year, we returned $180 million and doubled the number of claims processed. How did we do that? We found answers in technologies. We augmented our website. We created a new electronic claims process for certain properties and created a fast tracking process for others. In the process, we saved a lot of paper as well. The result, three consecutive years of record breaking, and I think we're on pace to do it to break that record again this year. Because now we have a new program called Money Match, which will match our database with other databases, allowing us to just send checks to people if we can verify they still live at that address. They'll be able to claim their money without really having to lift a finger. They will have to lift a finger to, to open the letter and to cash it, but that hopefully they'll be able to do. Now in most years, in most terms, that would be enough. You know, we could say that we've um, increased investment returns, we've increased our college savings exponentially, we've quadrupled our ROI, we've increased utilization of MWBD firms, we use technology to return more money more quickly and more efficiently. Now, in a normal year, then I could take some of your questions, and I could make a few jokes about my height, and I could sit down, and we'd be enough, and have enough. But we all know we're not living in normal times. There are other crises out there. There are other problems. And we have things like a looming retirement crisis in the state of Illinois and in this country that is threatening all of us. We know that there are individuals with disabilities who have a tough time saving for their future. Parents are worried about what's going to happen when they're no longer there. We think the Illinois government doesn't always reflect the diversity of our state, and nor do all of our corporate boardrooms. Our bill backlog has been crippling to several small businesses and our service agencies. Now, traditionally, these are not areas where the state treasurer has been involved. Not our purview, it would be very easy to step aside. But I ask the question, why not? Why can't we be part of this? Why can't we do more? And so I want to talk about some of the ways we're stepping up to try and address these crises. So like our retirement crisis in this country, if those of you who aren't aware of it, we have a real crisis. About half of working age families have less than $5,000 saved for their retirement. About a third of retirees are going to rely on Social Security for 90% of their retirement income. That is not a retirement with dignity. That is a recipe for disaster. So what is the answer? Traditionally, the state treasurer has had no role in this. But we have rolled out a new program called Secure Choice. Secure Choice is a portable savings program, workplace deduction, travels with the employee. This money's going to go into a Roth IRA to help them save their own money and be able to make their own investments. But the difference is it'll be at their workplace. Because if someone has a retirement savings option at their workplace, they are 15 times more likely to be saving for their retirement than someone who doesn't. It's a simple human nature. If you make it easy for them, if it just comes out of their paycheck, if they don't have to do anything else, they save. If you make them take active steps to go out and find a financial advisor, to choose from a variety of options, to write checks routinely, too many of our fellow citizens haven't done this. 
And this is a problem for them. This is a problem for their families. And it's a problem for all of us because there is a real crisis. So we're setting up a program to make it easier. We're working with employers. We've reached out and worked with employers like the Technology and Manufacturing Association with John Rauschenberger to make sure that we're hearing the concerns of employers and addressing them before this rolls out. Right now, we are wrapping up our pilot program. We wanted to make sure that we determined any problems that are out there. And a smaller set, we've got employers who are willing to sign up. And if we discover them, we can fix them before we roll out to our next set of employers. So starting this fall, employers with more than 500 employees who don't offer a retirement savings option, we're going to be signing them up and giving their employees an opportunity to easily save for their retirement. This is something we're very excited about, and I want to thank my team for helping to set this up. I mentioned helping people with disabilities. You know, I think Jay is probably aware of this, you know. If you have someone who has a severe disability and they qualify for SSI, that program is means tested. What that means is they have an asset cap. They can't have more than $2,000 in assets. If you have more than $2,000, you lose your federal benefits. That's an artificially low amount. What that means is most families can't save anything for their kids. And that's why they are so worried about what happens to their child after they're gone. How can they save without losing their benefits? Well, we have an answer, and it's called ABLE. It stands for Achieving a Better Life Experience. They're savings accounts that operate an awful lot like college savings accounts. Parents can put money in, they can invest it. The growth is tax-free, as long as it's used for disability-related expenses. But also the wonderful thing is they can save up to $100,000 in these accounts without losing their children's benefits. And I've had parents come to me and cry and say thank you. Because they've been forced into positions where, like one father, he told me, I had to tell my dad, Dad, I know you like to give cash for birthdays and the holidays to your grandchildren. Just please don't. What kind of parent tells their parent, don't give money to your grandkids? It's a parent who's concerned about their child losing their benefits. Or like the mother out there who was so proud, she had an adult daughter with Down syndrome. She worked, she got a job at a large law firm. She'd go in, she'd sort the mail, she'd deliver the mail, she'd do it with a smile, and everyone liked her. They liked her so much they offered her a raise. Her mother had to say, no, do not give her a raise. Because the extra money that she would get would be more than offset by the benefits she would lose. So we were really excited when we passed this legislation. We re reached out to a lot of investment managers who wanted to work with us on college savings plans and said, how would you like to work with us on this ABLE program? And how do you suppose they responded? Were they as excited as I was? <laughs> no, they were not. Actually, they said, no thanks, we're not interested. We asked why. Why would you not be interested in helping these people with disabilities have a brighter future? They said, well, there's just not a large enough economy of scale here. See, our college savings accounts were over 600,000 accounts, but our ABLE accounts, they picked, figure maybe 30,000. So we could have complained, we could have called them names, could have stamped our feet, but we decided to listen. You know, I like to tell people that the good Lord gave us two ears and one mouth. And you should use them in that proportion. Spend more time listening than you do lecturing, and you're likely to learn something. What we learned was other states had the same problem. We called them in for a conference here in Chicago. They had the same problem, and we got this crazy idea. What if we all worked together? What if we all pooled our residents? Then we would have greater economies of scale. And so we joined initially with 10 states and put on an RFP, and we were able to negotiate the lowest fees in the country for an ABLE program. Now, it's, when you hear a politician say, I negotiated the lowest fees, I am the best negotiator, you, you should probably be a little skeptical. But I will tell you that Illinois has the lowest fee program in the country, because so does Iowa, and so does Minnesota, and so does Indiana, and so does Rhode Island, and New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, and North Carolina. And so does Montana, and Colorado, and Nevada, and Alaska, and Kansas. Now, if you look, listen to those states, they don't all go together. The Kansas State Treasurer and I, who we work together on this, we agree on political issues about 0% of the time. He just sees the world very differently. But we didn't let our differences get in the way of helping our constituents. 
we found that when you're willing to share some credit, you're able to accomplish an awful lot more. And so that initial group of 10 has grown into 15, as other states have asked to join our consortium. And as a result, there will be hundreds of thousands of families around this country that will be able to save for their children with a disability in a way that won't eat up their savings and won't risk their, won't have their benefits. <laughs> so thank you. I, I'm really excited about this, but this wouldn't happen without my team. I mean, this really uh, is a team effort. So after setting up ABLE, there are other problems out there that need to be addressed. You know, I mentioned with the uh, MWD broker dealers, you know, I traveled this state and I saw a great diversity of this state. And I saw that that diversity wasn't necessarily reflected in our office. We made some changes there. We made changes with those firms that we work with, but also we occasionally invest in companies. And what we saw is not every company out there reflected the diversity, the great diversity of our state. There were a lot of boards that were homogenous. Well, we decided when we're making investments, we want to get the best return possible. And there's a study conducted by McKinsey that showed a more diverse bo board outperforms a homogenous board by about 35%. Because if you get more backgrounds around the table, you get more voices, you address more problems, you see more opportunities than when everyone has the same background. And so we've made it our point to encourage companies that we invest in to make sure they have greater board diversity. This is about maximizing returns on our investment. It's about doing the right thing, both in terms of our fellow humans, but also in terms of our fiduciary duty. And we've taken other steps as well to make sure the companies we're investing in are cognizant of environmental and social and governance issues. We want to make sure that they're growing their companies for the long term. You know, one of the problems that we see, or that I see, is a lot of companies are focused on the next quarter. What can we do to maximize profits this quarter to, to boost our shareholder price in the next quarter? You know what? Most families don't invest for a quarter. Most families saving for college don't have a three-month timeline. People saving for their retirement surely, hopefully, do not have a three-month timeline. They're investing for a longer term. We want to make sure that these companies are built to last and to have steady growth over the course of their investments. And so we created a new program called Raising the Bar which we work with other state treasurers and other pension funds to make sure that companies are making long-term decisions, that they, have, they produce results for a while, because that's what our clients, our families saving for college, expect. Now, one other thing that we probably need to touch on is there has been a budget impasse. I don't think anyone, this is not news to anyone out there. Um, people would stop me frequently and say, you know, why don't you pass a budget? I'd love to. Constitution doesn't allow the treasurer to, to pass a budget. It doesn't allow me a formal role. We could have sat back and, and asked uh, why. We could have given excuses. But we said, why not? Why can't we be part of this? Well, the state of Illinois, because it hadn't passed a budget in a while, had racked up tens of billions of dollars in unpaid bills. And on many of those bills, they were paying 9 to 12% interest. About a billion dollars went out to Wall Street bankers that could have been spent fixing our roads and bridges or making improvements in our schools. We said, what can we do to keep more of that money here? Well, I told you earlier some of those numbers. We invest billions of dollars. We got this crazy idea. What would stop us from buying those receivables? You know, we have money sitting in state funds growing. Why can't we use that to bring down the rate of interest the state of Illinois is paying? and to retain more of that interest in state accounts. And so, as a former state senator, we filed a bill. And we worked that bill. And just to let you know, this isn't uh, just a Democrat saying, I have a great bill. One Republican in the House said this was one of the most innovative ideas he's seen in his time in Springfield. By asking questions like, why not, we find solutions to problems that we haven't traditionally got involved with in the past. And just also so you know, hot, fresh and hot off the presses, Moody's Investor Services today issued a report that says this legislation, legislation we passed, will help the state to greatly curtail further late penalty accruals. This is some good news for the state of Illinois. Now, Senate Bill 2858, if you want to look, allows my office to invest our state's receivables 
We can pump money into the private sector, money into companies that help the least among us and who are waiting to be paid. So I want to thank you all for being here today. Uh, you've been very generous in your applause. Um, it is very nice as a politician to receive applause. We all like it. <laughs> but I'm going to do something most politicians don't do, is let you know much of this was undeserved by me. No. I work off that quote. Um, you know, some people see things the way they are and ask why. I dream of the way things could be and ask why not. And I do do that. But the real heavy lifting, the real work that made these programs happen, the increase in return on investment, the increase of MWVD utilization, setting up a retirement savings program, setting up a savings program for people with disability, all of these things happen because I have a phenomenal staff. And I've asked you a couple of times to thank them. We're joined by many of them here today. Uh, I would ask you all to raise your hands. You can stand if you want. Actually, I'm going to ask you all to stand because you're my employees. And you still are for a little while, Cherise. And join them in giving them a hand. Thank you all. I truly do think we have uh, some phenomenal numbers. We have wonderful stories to share. Uh, and we're able to share them because of the hard work of these people. So uh, with that, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to attempt to answer them. Ed? Thank you. Let's give Treasurer Ferrix a big round of applause. And I'm sure there will be a lot of people here who leave here and uh, call their brokers, close out their accounts, I want to meet with Mike and this Rodrigo fellow and see if we can get in on that great deal. Okay, terrific. If anybody has any questions, you've got these blue three by five cards at your table. If you just write down your question, we have staff members here. They will collect that, bring it up here. We'll try to answer as many of these questions as we can. Ah, here we go. Ask and you shall receive. It's even printed, which means we can read it. What, e what effect do you expect President Trump's Chinese tariffs will have on Illinois business, and to what extent will that affect Illinois' tax revenue? This is from City Club member Bird Hoffman. Bird, where are you? Right over there. Okay. Mr. Treasurer? Right. Unfortunately, I think it's going to have a negative effect in Illinois. It may, there may be some benefits in certain areas, and I think in certain parts of Illinois. I think President Trump has tried to claim credit for steel mills reopening. But I can tell you, I live downstate. I grew up in a small farming community. And you've seen a real hit in terms of commodity prices. You know, it's one thing to say we're going to stand tough and issue tariffs on people uh, other countries. But what that frequently means is they retaliate, and they retaliate with a lot of our exports. And Illinois has done a great job of exporting and creating wealth for the state. And when you see these commodity prices sinking, that is less wealth coming into the state of Illinois. We've tried to ad address this somewhat in our office by making improvements to our Ag Invest program. Because I think that's where a lot of this is going to take effect, but there are all kinds of industries, all kinds of businesses that will have negative consequences by this trade war. He tells us to have faith that ultimately the U.S. is going to prevail here. But I think that years of history have shown that by actually entering into engagements rather than trade wars is a way to make sure business prospers in the state. So this will have a negative impact on the state. I think it's a little too early right now to determine how large. Thank you. Um, this is a pre-submitted question from a gentleman named Li Chen, who's a city club member with Vendor Capital Finance LLC. How does the treasurer plan to execute his new role as a qualified purchaser in the vendor payment program. Will you focus on paying down invoices, PP interest, or both? How quickly do you plan on deploying these funds? Uh, the answer quickly is we plan deploying these funds very soon. We're in touch with the comptroller's office. But in terms of prioritizing, I'm the chief investment officer for the state of Illinois. The comptroller is the chief fiscal officer. The comptroller pays the bills. Uh, the other part of that question probably is best answered by the comptroller. But we're going to pay down, pay down bills. And we think, we estimate, we could save about $100 million a year in interest payments by doing it this way. I told you it was 9 to 12 percent, depending on what kind of vendor you were we were paying. We reduced that interest rate to 3.5 percent. The good news is that saves the state a lot of money. 
The good news is for us, because we have to be very conservative in our approaches, 3.5% is a good return. That's going to allow us to bring even more money back into our other state funds. But in terms of uh, prioritization, that would be a question for the comptroller. Thank you. Um, how do you feel about combining the two offices? I think we can combine the two offices. It's something I voted when I was in the state senate to allow the people of the state of Illinois to have some say on. It would require a constitutional amendment. I campaigned saying we should do that. I came into office and I reached out to the previous comptroller and said, let's work together on putting together a plan. Because I think if you're going to sell this to the public, you, know, you have to tell them how it's going to actually work. To just say you're going to merge the two offices without knowing how it would look and how you would deal with uh, proper internal controls and to make sure there are checks and balances in place, I think is irresponsible. So we're more than happy to work with the Civic Consulting Alliance uh, on a plan that would show exactly what it looked like. And I think if we do that, if we bring in some outside experts and demonstrate, I think the public would agree with me that we can merge the two offices. Okay, thank you. Um, this is from A.J. Shaw, City Club member with Globetrotters Engineering Corporation. The Bright Start Savings 529 program does not provide an annual rate of return. This is a basic and fundamental metric in investment management. Why wasn't it required of the provider before their website went live? When will it be available? Okay. Our Bright Start require an annual rate of return. We help people to invest in themselves. We give people the tools they need to invest in themselves, to give their, themselves and their family a brighter future. And we think that helping people to save and invest is a good way to do that through our college savings plans. But we give people choices out there of how they want to invest. I'm not sure how you can guarantee them a rate of return. You know, they can take more risk if they want to be very conservative and we establish a rate of return, but we give people options because you know, that's what we believe in. That's the way the program has been structured and we haven't made a real change in that. The one change we really could guarantee was the percent they were paying in fees. And that was cut in half. The return depends on how much risk they want to take and how the market is doing. That we can't guarantee. Uh, I would reach out to Mr. Shaw if he has a follow-up question. We'd be happy to talk with him, but I, I'm not sure I completely understand exactly what he wants. Okay. Did you hear that, Mr. Shaw? Okay. Now, we gave you two tough questions. So this one I don't even understand, but I think it may have come from someone from your office. <laughs> Beard or mustache? You're going to have to explain that to us. It might even be explained to me. Obviously, as a politician, I'm a pander and say clearly the beard. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this is from Therese McMahon with Literacy DuPage right down here. Speaking for many small nonprofits, thank you for reestablishing the Charitable Trust Stabilization Fund. Will workforce and economic development continue to be one of your focus areas for funding in the upcoming calendar year. Okay, hold on to that. I just want to show people. Absolutely. Uh, I sat next to Teresa. This is a pre-printed question. I did not ask her to ask this one. You could have it. But, but I'm glad you did, because this was another program we came in, our charitable trust program. It had been established by state statute about a decade ago. It had started drawing money. So this was something that was pushed by nonprofits take a percentage of their uh, fees to the Attorney General's office and put them aside in the fund to help other smaller nonprofits. It sounded like a great idea. And no one did anything with it, except to collect the money. For years and years, they collected the money but didn't actually issue any grants. We came in, we conducted an audit. Our office, when we first came in, discovered it was one of our responsibilities, but my predecessors hadn't, my predecessors hadn't done anything with it. And so we went about setting up a charitable trust board giving make sure we had guidance of where the money would go. And our three areas of focus were with uh, food security, with housing, and with workforce development. And these are priorities I think make a real impact in the state of Illinois with a lot of people. And I antis anticipate that we'll continue to have that as those as priorities. Now, we have a board, and our board makes these decisions, but I think uh, I speak for a lot of them that I think we're going to continue to put money out in the state. And the other reason we made this a real priority was because when we came in, there was a budget impasse in place, and there were a lot of social service agencies who were not being paid. Some were having to close their doors and lay people off, and we asked the question, well, why can't we help out? I said, well, because it's not your job, and the answer is, why not? 
and we discovered charitable trusts, and we found other ways through unclaimed property, actively reaching out to social service agencies, to nonprofits that had money, and to reuniting them with that. So hopefully they keep the doors open a while longer, that they could employ people a little while longer. Okay, thank you. There was um, something I think that in the last couple of weeks uh, that I read or heard about, and I don't remember exactly, but I'm sure you will. Um, you pushed or helped a piece of legislation get passed that you thought would really benefit people in the state of Illinois. The governor felt otherwise. I'm Vito? not sure which one you're talking about. No. Okay. <laughs> he vetoed six of our bills. I don't remember all six, but I thought if you wanted to say something about that, do you intend to uh, reintroduce that legislation? Do you think if um, we have a different governor after the election, there might be a more favorable response to one, if not all six of those okay. bills? Yeah, there, there were several bills. I've got a legislative team that is very aggressive, and they keep telling me, Treasurer, give us more work to do. Please, we want to push more bills. And I thank you for that approach, Catherine. Uh, he vetoed six, but we passed several more. But I'm not sure why he chose. Maybe it's because it's election season. I mean, one of the bills that he vetoed had passed unanimously in the House and the Senate. Another might have had 13 no votes. It really, they were head scratchers. So no, I do not intend to reintroduce re them. We intend to override his vetoes. Yeah. Yeah. We're uh, my parents raised me with a good work ethic, and they didn't raise me to be a quitter. We're not going to quit. If for some reason we're not able to override his vetoes, we will reintroduce them next year because every bill that we have put forward, we believe, has a positive impact on the state. Okay, those are fighting words. You could take that one to the bank. Great. Now, we have two questions here that are relatively uh, similar but somewhat different. Um, one, I think you've done a great deal of uh, job of answering, but you might want to work it into this next response. But uh, Charlie Garner, wants to know what is next for you, because you started off by saying you keep a suit in Chicago, so we assume it's in a closet in a basement or a building or something. Crawl space. Crawl space. <laughs> and you could probably qualify to be a registered voter here in the city of Chicago if you really do want to run for mayor. But clearly the question is, what is next on your agenda? I'm going to walk back to the James R. Thompson Center. I'm going to meet with the Pennsylvania State Treasurer and talk about some ways that we can work together on things like our Raising the Bar program, um, some things we can do because we work with Pennsylvania, our ABLE program. And, uh, and then I'm going to drive back home because I have a nine-year-old daughter at home and Champagne, and she gets done with school, and I'm going to pick her up and spend the evening with her. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. There was, there was one other question I wanted to answer, though. Go ahead. Well, what was the last one? Oh. I was asked what my vision is. Right. And it was funny. And it was appropriate. It's a lot better today than it was before. As I've been running around the state, I've been too busy to get my eyes examined for the last four years. And just recently, I went down to the uh, Illinois Optometric College um, and got my vision. And now, I see a lot better. And I want to thank Vince for your help with that. I had, to give, I had to give a plug to them. Absolutely. Absolutely. And they took your state insurance, right? Yes, we did. Okay. <laughs> Vince, that's very good. It's very important. Fine. Um, we have one, two last items, but let's give Treasurer Frerichs a big round of applause. And thank you very much.